Okay, the Center for Advanced Energy Studies was established by the Department of Energy to support INL mission accomplishment alongside uh, helping the Idaho universities meet their aspirations to grow their research capabilities. And we do that by developing and sustaining research partnerships that attract and retain the best and brightest faculty, students, and researchers. A key step in aligning university research with lab and therefore national energy research priorities with particular emphasis on all aspects of nuclear energy, recognizing first that nuclear energy is the main source of low carbon energy in the U.S. today, and secondly, that whether or not the U.S. builds another nuclear power plant, which of course are under construction today, but nevertheless, the rest of the world will. And without U.S. scientific and engineering leadership, others may repeat such mistakes as of the past as Chernobyl and Fukushima. Uh, OKs is a public-private partnership. We focus on maximizing the resources of the partners, and we have a special focus on fostering technology-based economic development. We focus in five research areas. <clears throat> Each area emphasizes INL mission alignment and the priorities of the Idaho Research Universities alongside the economic interests of the state. So energy efficiency, bioenergy, geofluids, energy science, advanced materials, and nuclear science and engineering. Uh, for example, uh, the case focus on bioenergy is on dairy waste. That's a, it's a very important to the state economically. It's, it's also a large environmental pro problem. Each of the partners brings uh, special capabilities to, to that research, and our goal is to work closely with producers to help them meet both their economic and their environmental goals. Um, the most obvious manifestation of what CAES does for the state that's of interest to this committee is we try to provide state-of-the-art tools, world-class capabilities that, that can be used for economic development. For example, in our, uh, our MAX lab, our Advanced Microscopy and Characterization Suite, we have world-class tools uh, depicted in the, in the graph here. I'll just call your attention uh, in particular to the spark plasma centering system and also the local electrode atom probe. These are tools that there's a, a single digit number of these in the U.S. today. Uh, we have both of them available uh, in Idaho Falls. Not only are they available to students, researchers, and faculty, but they're also available to the private sector. We have organized the way that we manage these machines so that the private sector can come in and use these on an hourly basis. Um, uh, we've had customers such as Micron, for example, and other engineering firms around the state are already coming to case using these tools. But the, the point of, of these tools in particular is to support material science research. We think that the, the major pathways to energy solutions will involve advances in material science, materials that perform better, materials that are cheaper, materials that are safer. Uh, for example, we use our local electrode atom probe to image at the atomic level uh, materials such as the oxide dispersion strength and alloy depicted uh, here in the graph. What you're seeing is a graph that's about 40 nanometers square and about 90 nanometers tall. Each dot in the graph is, is the accurate location of an atom in a solid sample. The point of being able to uh, generate these is so that we can analyze at the atomic scale how materials perform. So for example, at the case facility, we can fabricate novel materials beginning with elemental powders, test those materials, and then analyze them at the atomic scale to give people insights into material performance. For, for example, in the case of these alloys, these have extraordinarily high heat strength. When they are you know, hot, and I mean really hot, like 600 degrees centigrade, they still re are very strong. The trick is that they're very difficult to process. For example, uh, forming these into tubes and welding the tubes together is very challenging. We're working on all aspects of these materials uh, in Idaho Falls you know, with, with students, faculty from all three universities, and researchers from the Idaho National Lab. Another capability that we have in Idaho Falls at the Case facility 
is a four-wall th uh, 3D cave. This enables researchers to depict uh, uh, data from almost any source in 3D at a scale that they can literally walk into. And it, this type of research enables transformations in, ac across all fields. Um, for example, you know, here, here's a case of somebody who's doing biological research. It's, it's much easier to count the cells in a sample when the cells are as big as basketballs. And you can walk in to the swarm of cells and look at them from all sides as they exist in nature. And here's an example from geology. This is, this is uh, part of the Jenny Lake Basin over in uh, Grand Teton National Park. Uh, this, this, these data were collected by flying an airplane over the region with a LIDAR system, capturing very high resolution imagery of the ground condition. Research like this enables you to go back year after year, quickly scan the same site and detect changes in the ground. For example, if you're interested in geologic shifts or you're interested in uh, forest uh, uh, changes, these data are detailed enough that when you zoom in, you can pick out the deer hiding in the trees. Uh, it's, it's quite amazing. Um, but again, the, these, these tools are available in Idaho Falls. Uh, partners such as uh, Idaho, uh, Idaho Falls Power are using these to help them understand siting, for example, for uh, transmission lines. And uh, in, in addition to, and we, ha we have students coming from all three universities to, to use these tools. Um, and just to quickly wrap up, um, in the last three years, uh, K's affiliates have won over $45 million worth of new research. These are dollars that come into the state and get spent on salaries, that get spent on equipment, that get spent on students. Uh, and as you can see, our nuclear science and engineering enrollments are up from a few dozen students six years ago to near 500 students. Of course, these research dollars are what sustain those students. You know, uh, we have an industrial energy assessment center established uh, through the Case Energy Efficiency Research Institute here in Boise. This trains engineering students to conduct energy assessments in industrial facilities. We've de developed leadership in energy siting and small modular reactor analysis through the Case Energy Policy Institute, which is here in Boise at Boise State. And just as a for instance, in uh, last year in 2011, Case sponsored uh, researchers produced over 90 peer-reviewed publications. You know, I think what this points to collectively is that working together, we have really put Idaho on the map. We are becoming a go-to place for people who are interested in doing this kind of research. Of course, we have a national lab, but national labs can, can appear somewhat prickly to outsiders. What we've done at Kays is create a publicly accessible space where the three universities and the lab can come together to do work in the national interest especially focused on nuclear energy. Thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> Any questions from the commission? That's very helpful. Or, or you can hold to the end. And we can yeah, which I mean, we can so, kind of adapt as we go here. I think yeah. each, each of my colleagues is going to take a little deeper dive. And Fantastic. So. Good afternoon again. Um, what I'd like to do is kind of expand on Dr. Grosshan's uh, talk and, and, and address specifically Idaho's role in workforce development uh, and economic development in terms of nuclear energy. Um, you know, it's been brought up already several times uh, this morning, earlier today, uh, that of course we need to look at the past, um, learn from the past, um, use what we've learned to go forward for the future, but also address what's going on currently and how we can uh, make substantial changes and improvements to the Idaho economy. Um, I, again, I'm probably speaking to the choir here and stating that you know, Idaho has had a very proud and illustrious history in nuclear science and energy research development that goes back 
uh, really more than 50 years. I'm just giving you some examples here in terms of ARCO being the first community in the world lit by electricity generated by nuclear power. Of course, we had the uh, inception of the National Reactor Testing Station, which is now uh, part of the Idaho National Lab. And of course, uh, we're very proud of the nuclear education uh, history that we have in the state. Um, with the current infrastructure in place, the manpower available, uh, manufacturing development um, in Idaho has an even greater chance, really, to become part of the state's economy, especially in nuclear energy and nuclear science and engineering technologies. So it's very vital for us to continue to build upon our expertise uh, and integrate the various areas of nuclear R&D, technology uh, deployment, development, manufacturing, and service capabilities that we have throughout the state, uh, including INL and, again, various companies and educational facilities that we have. Uh, just some interesting facts to, to kind of put in perspective um, uh, the, the economies of scale, I guess, for nuclear energy. Um, you know, nuclear energy provides almost 20 percent of the U.S.'s electricity and about 13 and a half percent worldwide. There's 104 operating reactors in the U.S. Uh, and about 435 worldwide. Uh, we talk, or we've heard about, uh, you know, the the uh, Renaissance not necessarily happening, uh, but I, I beg to differ. Um, there are about 63 new nuclear power plants in construction around the world, and we do have a couple here in the U.S. at the Vogel site in Georgia. Uh, the cost of new plant construction estimates around $4 billion in today's uh, dollars for the engineering procurement and construction, uh, with about $22.5 billion um, estimated for an entire two-unit plan in 2022. 20, uh, um, this may seem uh, fairly expensive, but what I would like to present to you is, is a little bit later on some of the uh, companies that we have in the uh, proud state of Idaho that can offer some of the services for building these plants. And again, that brings in revenue to the state. Uh, the total U.S. revenue in the nuclear power industry is almost $400 billion. Um, and then just some other facts here as well about what the uh, DOE budget is for, new, uh, for any, a lot of which comes uh, here to Idaho. Um, another important fact, especially from an educational and, and um, uh, workforce uh, perspective is that nearly 50 percent of the workforce in the uh, commercial nuclear power industry is, is due to retire within 10 years. Um, so it's something that we can help um, address here. Uh, this has also been presented in terms of the number of plants or, and where they're located in the U.S. And I mentioned, too, about possible construction. Again, uh, this is a reality already in the U.S. at the Vogel site in Georgia, but these are other potential um, sites that have uh, put in inquiries or, or are beginning the licensing process for new reactors. So um, nuclear energy is alive and well in the United States. Um, again, Idaho, uh, preaching to the choir here, but we do have a very substantial nuclear infrastructure in Idaho. Um, if, of course, um, we're familiar with Idaho National Lab, but our three universities as well, um, again, um, make uh, very large contributions to nuclear science and energy education, research, uh, and technology development. Uh, in education specifically, uh, Boise State University of Idaho and ISU all play very important roles uh, through the integration of CASE uh, in nuclear energy and, again, nuclear science and engineering as well. Uh, to give you an idea of our enrollments, uh, if you look at all three universities, we provide a very large um, number of students to the nuclear science and engineering workforce. Uh, total current enrollment through um, essentially associates all the way to Ph.D. level uh, are nearly 300. Uh, if you put that in perspective, the largest uh, nuclear science and engineering university department in the country is Texas A&M. They have about 400 students. So if you look at the combination of Idaho, we, uh, we, we fare um, uh, very competitively, I guess you could say, with um, some of the very largest universities in the uh, country. Um, our external dollars, again, Dr. Grosshan's already mentioned this somewhat, um, but we've also been very successful. Um, when MIT comes out and, and says um, that they are upset that Idaho is winning too much money in, in, in these areas, you know that that says something. Um, so over the last few years, since really the, the start of CASE, um, we have um, 
been awarded nearly $50 million in, in again, nuclear science and engineering uh, research dollars, uh, scholarships and fellowships, as well as infrastructure development. Um, just very quickly, I also want to mention that in terms of economic development, we have several companies in Idaho that are providing opportunities not only in the state but throughout the country. Um, just very quickly, two um, specific ones, again, that are, that are making major contributions. Uh, International Isotopes uh, is a company that deploys uh, and develops innovative technological solutions. Um, these are just some of the examples where they are using uh, radioactive materials and advanced nuclear technologies for helping the citizens of Idaho and the country as well. International Isotopes has also partnered with Idaho State University and Case in uh, development of medical isotopes. Uh, they also uh, have been approved for a new um, uh, deconversion and fluorine extraction process facility in New Mexico. Um, another company, or some other aspects, again, I mentioned uh, me medical isotope production at the IEC uh, and also some other medical treatment uh, technologies as well. Uh, another very proud company that we have here in Idaho is uh, Premier Technology Incorporated. Uh, specifically in the nuclear um, uh, industry um, arena. Um, Premier Technology uh, is involved with uh, nearly $30 million in sales and uh, I think up to nearly $400 million pending for new plant reactor development as well as outage and construction support. So again, a company that we have here that um, that is uh, vital to the, to the economy and uh, part of and it was going to be part of the, uh, the future of nuclear energy in the um, United States. Uh, also, I'd like to mention, even though the project is on hold, uh, but we're all familiar with the Areva Eagle Rock and Richmond facility, uh, which has a projected or anticipated construction and start date now, I think, at 2014. Um, but this is a $3 billion industry that will be here in Idaho. Um, there is a $2 billion loan guarantee from DOE. Uh, the project expects to create thousands of construction jobs, 700 permanent positions uh, once it becomes operational. So this will result in billions of dollars to the Idaho economy and millions, tens to hundreds of millions of dollars um, which will come to the state in support services, support companies for this facility. So um, again, very important to the economy. Uh, to kind of finish up here, uh, again, Dr. Grosshands talked about this a little bit, but at CASE, uh, in our nuclear science and engineering initiative, we've been very fortunate in bringing in new faculty, new staff. We've had very large uh, enrollment increases in the area. This brings money to the, uh, to the state, of course, and I mentioned also the, uh, the, the funding that we brought in over the various fiscal years in research, infrastructure uh, dollars. So uh, just to conclude, um, Idaho has been and, and will continue to be a leader in nuclear education and research, uh, especially with a lot of the increased collaborations that we've forged over the last several years. Uh, in addition, we're becoming a leader in nuclear technology and development. I, I showed you a few of the companies that are involved with that. Um, and, we, you know, we must realize uh, that the importance of nuclear has and will continue uh, to have really on the economy, uh, and there's still enormous potential that could exist in the state. So, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, members of the commission, uh, I was asked to give a presentation on uh, material science and engineering and some of the observed benefits of, uh, of nuclear materials research in particular, not only on, um, uh, on our research activities in general, but on sort of synergies with other research areas. Um, and I'll give you one example of a project because we're limited to time and Jason and, and Ray both gave uh, a couple of examples and I'll provide you with some summary comments. Uh, if you look at the corner diagram, uh, which is a rather simple uh, triangle, uh, I show um, uh, four corners that represent um, sort of the broad areas of material science and what we do as material scientists. Uh, essentially what we do is we connect 
structure, um, atomic structure, microstructure, nanostructure of materials uh, with properties. We develop techniques for making these materials in order to achieve a certain type of performance. And that's essentially, in a nutshell, what a material scientist does. And this next diagram shows uh, material science sort of at the apex or the center of uh, all the engineering fields. Um, material science is central to um, mechanical engineering, uh, uh, chemical engineering, nuclear engineering, electrical engineering, uh, aerospace engineering, etc. And so the things that we develop, for example, in the nuclear engineering field uh, often end up used in other fields. So there's a strong synergy between any research that we do in material science that's related to nuclear energy and these other fields. So uh, the research, for example, that we do at K's in, in nuclear materials benefits many other energy fields. Here's a few examples, and so what I did is I sat down and I thought about some of the concrete examples where there's a direct synergy between the research that we're doing at Kays uh, and in the state of Idaho and other areas of, uh, of research that are going on. And so in each case, I came up with a specific example in my mind. I won't go through all those in, in, in this venue, but um, for example, uh, many of the materials research we're doing, for example, with ODS alloys, which Dr. Grosshans mentioned earlier, uh, is of great value to the fossil energy industry. Um, we're developing sensors for aircraft for uh, medical purposes. Uh, we're developing materials that are relevant to the aerospace industry. Uh, we do research in corrosion and sustainability. Five percent of the gross domestic product in this country is lost to corrosion. And so we're doing research that, uh, that benefits uh, um, those types of issues. Uh, battery materials, uh, fuel cell materials, gas separation membranes, for example, for syngas production, um, which could be one of the largest materials industries in the country if we can pull it off. Um, solar materials, catalysts, biomaterials for medical applications, high performance thermal insulation, armor and energy arresting materials, and uh, an area that's going to become fairly important for this country is replacing rare materials, rare earth elements, for example, um, with, uh, with less expensive um, elements. Uh, all of these things are, are being um, made stronger or, or we're, we're uh, gaining research funds and expertise in this state, I should say from our nuclear materials R&D. Here are some other benefits, um, and some of these uh, have already been discussed previously. Um, in some sense, I, I, I'm sort of an outsider, I should tell you, although I lived in Grangeville, Idaho, and Kuski, Idaho, when I was a small kid. Um, I moved away from Idaho when I was fairly young, uh, lived on the East Coast most of my life, and uh, I came back to Idaho uh, in 2005, I left a fairly cushy tenured position at one of the top departments, materials departments in the United States to come here um, at great risk to my reputation, I have to tell you. Um, I didn't know exactly what I was getting myself into. Uh, and uh, a lot of people asked what the heck I was doing. Um, but uh, I came here for a couple of reasons. One was to uh, help grow a, a new department at Boise State University, and the other reason was because of what I saw happening at the Center for Advanced Energy Studies in Idaho Falls, which I had started working with uh, in 2005, and then when I heard what was happening at Boise State and Kays, uh, I ended up deciding to come here. Fortunately, Micron paid my way, so I have to thank them too. But. Um, and, uh, and so K's is a huge benefit of uh, the nuclear energy uh, phenomenon that's taking place in this country right now, uh, aided in large part by the BEA contract, I have to add to that. Um, it's allowed us to establish national user facilities. It's provided universities in Idaho with major computational resources that many other universities, even major universities, don't have access to. Uh, it's allowed growth in um, our nuclear en engineering and our material science programs at the Idaho universities, as you've heard. Uh, it's allowed us to grow our extramural R&D support by orders of magnitude. Um, it has allowed us to increase um, Idaho University and INEL collaborations in ways that's very difficult for people to appreciate. Prior to K's, these collaborations uh, were rather rare, I have to tell you, and now it's commonplace, which has created tremendous synergies between the institutions. Idaho is a state that, you know, maybe I shouldn't say this, but probably can't afford to have three major um, engineering uh, colleges. 
Um, and But when they work together, they are a major engineering college. And uh, so we've been very successful by leveraging off of one another. It's allowed us to also increase our collaborations with external institutions, which raises the reputation of all of our institutions in Idaho. And I'll give one example of that in a minute. Uh, and frankly, it, you know, I told you I came here at great risk to my reputation. Um, I think it's actually benefited my reputation by coming here, and that's because the reputation of all the universities in Idaho has, has dramatically increased in the last uh, five years or so, and Ks, frankly, and B, the BEA contract have a lot to do with that. Uh, and it also has improved educational opportunities, not just at the university level, but at the K through 12 level. This is just one example of a project that's, that we recently have obtained, and I could give many, many examples, um, and I picked this one somewhat randomly, um, but it's a, it's a nice example because it shows a large number of collaborators. Um, we recently were awarded a DOE uh, IRP grant, which is a center grant. Only two were awarded in the United States. Um, one went to MIT and one went to us. Uh, this is a $5 million grant. One million of, the, of those funds comes to Idaho, and the rest is shared by these other institutions. Uh, it's led by Texas A&M. Um, Boise State University, though, leads uh, in the area of novel system monitoring and also is uh, heavily involved in canister corrosion. The focus of this research is on developing new technologies uh, for monitoring spent nuclear fuel uh, storage. Now, um, although that's the focus, there's already benefits that we're seeing. Um, we're in the process of filing two patents at Boise State, even though we only started this research in March. Um, we see many applications for the sensors we're developing uh, in food industry, in the aerospace industry, in the auto industry. Uh, one of my postdocs is already starting to think about how he's going to start a company to, to sell these sensors. Uh, and so uh, that's an example of how uh, what's going on has helped us develop tremendous collaborations and spin off um, new technologies potentially um, in areas other than nuclear. Um, this next slide uh, is, um, I'm not going to go into the details of it, but this next slide is just to, meant to kind of alert you to something that's going on. If you're not on, already aware, there's a new initiative called the Materials Genome Initiative, which is poised to take over uh, much of the activity at um, many of the funding agencies that we uh, seek our research grants from, uh, in particular DOE, DOD, NIST, and the National Science Foundation. The objective of the materials genome is to accelerate commercialization of technologies uh, in large part by leveraging off of modeling, simulation, uh, and, uh, and our expertise in material science. Um, this is, um, uh, has the potential to be a major, major program in the United States. Uh, and Kays is poised to be a major player in that initiative. Um, I would give you more information if I had time. What I would suggest is if you Google sometime on uh, Materials Genome Initiative, it'll pop up and you get a lot more information on it. But it really is changing the way we're going to do research in this country. Um, and so uh, it's, material science is, is going to be a very important thing in the United States during the next uh, decades, I would, I would predict. And then finally, uh, just a summary comment. Um, uh, these are just, you know, this is sort of my opinion of, of, uh, of what's happening in Idaho. Um, nuclear energy is a core competency of Idaho, enabling educational opportunities, research prominence, and technology development in our state. Idaho is uniquely positioned to leverage off of INL's mission and our state's established and growing expertise in nuclear and material science and engineering. And with that, I'll conclude. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Butts. <clears throat> Even though you may have risked your reputation in coming out, we're glad you're here because you helped Mark Roden, Roden look good. So we're glad you're here. Good afternoon, Chairman Sayer and, and Commissioners. Uh, like I said, my name is Jeffrey Black, and I'm at the Economics Department at Boise State. And <clears throat> Oh, excuse me, let me back up. So I've been working in the nuclear, the economics of nuclear energy for quite a while, and, and since 2000, the year 2000, I've been uh, doing ex uh, economic impact estimates for uh, the economic impact of the Idaho National Lab and its critical role in Idaho's economy. And over the past couple of years, um, 
uh, have been uh, changing the focus from Idaho National Lab to the, um, the economic impacts of developing a small modular nuclear reactor um, program in the United States. And hold on, let me go. And so here's a quote from the International Atomic Energy Agency um, that the, it, that the, um, the path is set for, uh, for new uh, development in terms of small modular reactors and not necessarily shifting away from, from large, but in addition to uh, the development of large reactors. Two things here that are required, or excuse me, that are important is a uh, better match for grid capacity and uh, financing capabilities and uh, so their applicability to developing countries and, and uh, rural areas. So here's, since they're relatively new, uh, I thought I'd go over just quickly some of the advantages of small modular reactors. So small modular reactors are less than 300 megawatts, um, and their design features are, they're not just small versions of large reactors. They're completely different uh, design, so they have features that, uh, that are, yield large advantages for them. So one is their, their modular nature, their simplicity of design, um, and those, both of those lead to enhanced safety um, in terms of uh, lower safety requirements on site, and uh, all of which contribute to having lower uh, elect unit electricity costs. This is a key component is that they're, since they're smaller, their capital costs and the risk involved is much less. And this is applicable to not only more developed countries like ours, but also less developed countries in particular. In terms of more developed countries, this is a key. Uh, I just came from a conference in Washington, D.C., and Ameren, Missouri is partnering with Westinghouse. Ameren, Missouri is uh, the largest utility in, in uh, the Midwest, and they have 80 percent of their uh, capacity comes from coal-fired plant, uh, coal fire plants many of which are aging now, and so they are looking at, at replacing some of those aging coal fire plants. They initially were going to put in a large 1,200-megawatt uh, nuclear plant. The carrying costs, they, they have to, um, as you know, carry the, uh, the construction costs for the entire period that the large plant is built. They are unable to charge their ratepayers anything for the development and the construction of a new plant until that plant is online long time period. So instead of, instead of that, they looked at natural gas because the natural gas is, is attractive right now. They did some projections. Natural gas prices are already starting to move up elsewhere, and they were concerned that of the uh, uh, in potential increase in natural gas prices. So they're going to go with a series of uh, small modular nuclear reactors, 225 megawatts apiece. They can build one, get it online, start charging rate payers, and then sequentially build the next and uh, so it's already happening in here. And, it, and, and for less developed countries, the grid-appropriate nature of small modular reactors is key, especially in rural areas where you might not have the grid capacity to handle a, a 1,200 or 1,500 megawatt large plant. In addition, um, small modular reactors, in addition to electrical production, also have uh, a number of cogeneration opportunities that, that uh, large plants don't avail themselves of. An interesting, um, so the, uh, as one of the, one of the discussions in the uh, Rio Plus 20 conference that the United Nations just had concluded last week was there was a big, uh, one of the big topics was en overcoming energy poverty. So in a lot of, so of less developed countries, their infrastructure, they're ready to, they've been developing economically, they're coming up against um, an energy constraint, and, and Ghana is a perfect example where they have no coal, no oil, There's, they, they don't have any domestic source of electricity, they're, in, they're having to import it, and it's, it's extremely expensive. And so that's hindering their economic development. What they would, what they're probably going to do is the cheapest route possible, which is fossil fuel development. And one of the focuses, one of the things that came out of the Rio Plus 20 conference is imagine less developed countries all around the world, all starting to develop economically, going the fossil fuel route, being the cheapest, and what the carbon implications are for that. And so the recommendations were one of the functions that the World Bank and the IMF could be doing is fostering development of small modular reactors to foster economic development by and, and skip over the whole fossil fuel stage of development. 
Oops, excuse me. So over the past couple of years, we've been, uh, Boise State University has been partnering with uh, Idaho State University and University of Idaho to estimate what the economic impacts is of developing a uh, small modular nuclear reactor industry in the United States. And so what we've done is we, a couple of years ago, we did some market projections. What's the market uh, potential of these things globally in the United States and globally? So we projected some different uh, deployment scenarios. And then we got an estimate of what the demand for these things might be, and we converted it into, we just did a generic 100 megawatt uh, unit. So it's, it's on the small side for small modular reactors. But it's, uh, and so that's the, the generic plant that we did. What we did was we estimated the cost of, of making these things. It's difficult because most of the information is proprietary at this point. So we did some, uh, which we don't need to go into, some fancy cost estimation procedures. And uh, in order to do, and so then we came up with, uh, given the cost of producing these things, then we could um, estimate the economic impacts of, of designing and, and engineering and licensing them, building the manufacturing facilities to produce them, and then once, once those are in existence, then manufacturing, deploying, and operating uh, these units over time. So what we did first is, like I said, most of the information is proprietary, and we've done some work um, with uh, some of the companies that are, are developing these, so we have some proprietary information, um, and then the rest is based on, on publicly available information. So what we did was, a few years ago, there was, the, um, there was a, an effort to standardize the estimation of, of unit electric costs for nuclear plants. And it was the uh, generation for um, estimating cost guidelines. So what they did was they broke out the cost of construction of modular nuclear plants into 54 different categories. So their three-digit code of accounts is what they're called. Basically, everything that you can imagine, how, many, how much concrete is needed, at what stage, how much pipe is needed, and it's, it's down to detail. So we took that as a model and then used those cost um, accounting categories to estimate what the cost of uh, producing a small modular reactor is. So here's what we came up with in terms of our estimated costs. We don't need to spend a lot of time on it. but we, So the, the 54 three-digit accounts, you can roll them into two-digit accounts, and so that's what's, that's what's here. So basically the, the total, the overnight costs are uh, almost $400 million, and then some indirect costs on top of that. Now we have the cost of what's involved with constructing these things, then we can convert that into, uh, excuse me, we can convert that into economic impacts. There's economic impacts being generated from the design, engineering, and licensing phase. So we estimated that at $450 million. The Department of Energy last month um, just had a, uh, announced a uh, uh, competition for funds for developing and engineering and licensing small modular reactors. So the DOE made $452 million available for two different design types with cost, and equal, with cost sharing on the part of industry. So that's $900 million for two different designs. So for a, for a generic design that we estimated as $450 million to construct the manufacturing facility to build these things. We estimated $300 million. And then once it's built, then we use the, our code of accounts information, plug them into a input-output model that breaks down the, the U.S. economy into 440 different sectors and estimate the economic impacts of developing. Excuse me. So we have estimated impacts from from designing and engineering, from uh, manufacturing the, the facilities to build these things, and from deploying them. So we estimated we're going to take a moderate deployment schedule, which by 2013, they're going to start being built in 2020. By 2013, on average, there will be 14 of them produced in the United States, which is a reasonably considerate or a conservative estimate. So we're just building 14 of these things per year by, the, by 2013. There's also additional impacts from operations of these things. Once they're deployed, then there's economic impacts, jobs, et cetera, from operating them and refueling them. They need to be refueled every five years. 
So we took those estimates. And so from the, here's the economic impacts from the, from the research and development phase. So if it, just generically across the United States, then we have the value added numbers are basically the, the addition to gross domestic product. So it's $800 billion in, in uh, gross domestic product um, with creating uh, an, an over 10,000 uh, jobs. In Idaho, we just say that part of it, if part of the research and development money gets spent in Idaho, call it $100 million, then that's, that will create 1,800 jobs in, in Idaho and increase Idaho's gross domestic product by $108 million. First of a kind is their, their uh, construction of the, of the facilities nece necessary to build these things. And so we have, and so the, the, we have the, the building of, of the, those facilities plus the building of the first one that creates 17,000 jobs with $1.6 billion added to U.S. GDP. Oops, excuse me. And then once the first of a kind, then we have the repetitive construction and deployment and, and manufacturing and operation of, of units from there on. And so for each small modular reactor, it creates 13,000 jobs and adds over a billion dollars to U.S. GDP. Excuse me. <laughs> so by the time we build them over the 10-year period, well, for the 11-year period from 2019 through 2030, it has huge economic impacts. So we're talking about almost 2 million jobs added to the U.S. economy during this 11-year period and $150 billion added to U.S. GDP. So they're significant. So summary, each unit, each S small modular reactor unit uh, creates 13,000 jobs and, uh, and creates $2 billion worth of sales, $72 million in indirect business taxes. A point here is that the that investment of public funds gets quickly recouped through the generation of, uh, of, of uh, fiscal tax revenues. Then each one gets, uh, the, so then the cumulative deployment and operation of these things over the 11 year period creates almost 2 million jobs and almost $300 billion in sales and $8 billion in indirect business taxes. So initial investment of the, on the Department of the Department of Energy of $450 million to get these things off the ground then we have $8 billion being generated over the next 11 years in indirect business taxes. And that concludes my part of the presentation. Thank you. That's very interesting. Members of the commission, any questions for these fine gentlemen? Do we need more caffeine? Oh, sorry, please, Dr. Smith. You, uh, uh, you, when speaking, uh, reference was made to Texas A&M and the other sort of larger programs and a comparison between the combined uh, university capabilities relative to that. And there was also a comment made about the number of engineering colleges that exist in the state. And I was wondering if, if, uh, 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 if someone would address the infrastructure, organizational and structural constraints or opportunities that exist that uh, uh, that if we if the state were to address those, that would allow Idaho to move up into the next level with those kinds of institutions. Uh, I guess I need to take that one. Um, yeah, that's a, that's an excellent question. I mean, the re the reality is um, none of our engineering colleges have a critical mass. All right, um, we are none of us are comprehensive engineering colleges. Uh, we, each of us have uh, certain departments and certain niches which are strong. Um, at the same time, each of us have uh, departments that are, um, quite frankly, not very strong. Um, and uh, when you're in a, a really, really strong uh, uh, college of engineering, uh, collaboration naturally breeds and you're able to build um, uh, on those collaborations, for example, it's very difficult for any one of our engineering colleges to go after major center proposals. 
um, you know, for example, an EFRC type proposal, um, an Energy Frontier Research Center proposal. Um, and as a consequence, the only way we could do it in the state of Idaho, in my, pers in my view, uh, is um, uh, to collaborate between the institutions. Um, it, in terms of the structure, um, I kind of hesitate to give my opinion on how we would change the structure. Um, but uh, it, uh, it, there's no question that the universities have to work together. There are, there could be more formal ways of making the universities work together. Um, and at the risk of losing my job, I won't say how you might do that. But uh, if there was one University of Idaho in the state of Idaho and we all worked together, uh, that could be a powerful thing. Um, but instead, we tend to compete with one another. Um, and I'll just add to that, and that's one of the beauties of K's, is that the Center for Advanced Energy Studies has facilitated, if not forced us, to work together. Um, and it's it's been hard at times, but it's you know it's been a it's been a very it's been a lot of fun, and it's been uh, actually I think in, in retrospect great value to all three institutions. So. Can, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, are there uh, uh, you, you, are there infrastructure limitations that might be addressed in terms of, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, we're here talking about the, uh, the BAT settlement agreement and K's is as much an outgrowth of that settlement agreement as it is of, uh, of DOE's and, uh, and BEA's efforts since the, some of the funding that built the facility came from there. But are there other infrastructure sorts of things that, that, uh, uh, that might need to be addressed? And again, this doesn't have to be limited to uh, to Doctor, but I. I, you know, I, I think uh, more K's uh, is, is would be a good thing. Um, we, you know, we collaborate uh, as as much as we can, but we're geographically separated from K's by you know, a four-hour drive or I guess now an eight-hour flight. Um, and, uh, and, and that, that has a true. big impact. There's an activation energy to get us there. If there was a case in Boise and a case in Moscow where we tried to live together at those various places, um, I could see, you know, a great deal of benefit from that. And it wouldn't be necessarily another case. Maybe it's a center for ag research where we work together. Um, but getting our researchers physically together has a lot of benefit. And I think universities really have to take a step back and look at the structure. We have this formal structure at all of our universities that, uh, you know, is 100 years old, maybe maybe 500 years old. Um, and things are changing very, very rapidly in the education world. Um, and I think we need to think really hard about having colleges and departments that are where everything is so compartmentalized um, and starting to think more interdisciplinary in, in everything we do. Um, and, and so instead of having colleges have centers where we have people that have something in common and can collaborate, that's a very difficult thing to do at a university. So you know, universities, universities, you know, move at the speed of a, a battleship in port um, with no fuel, and um, typically, and three universities <laughs> all tied together move even slower. Um, it's not an easy thing to do, but at the same time, our universities are uh, more nimble, I'd say, than some of the major universities in the country. At least I'd like to think we are. Dr. Bayless. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, anyone can answer this uh, question. I think you've articulated very well that is, uh, collaboration brings a lot of benefit and um, possibilities by the universities working together. But we also know that the federal government plays a big role in that collaboration as well. It, my uh, question is, what has CASE done <clears throat> beyond the collaboration to think about how CASE is, if it were to evolve beyond the collaboration, become more self-sustainable? Uh, and sort of uh, like other organizations, not to be really dependent always on the government. 
Are there any plans or anything like that that Kays is or any other efforts going on to diversify the both the in, the interface of industry or anything else that could improve the future profile of support? Um. <clears throat> Uh, my, my opinion is that given the demographic and uh, demograph the geographic and demographic challenges of Idaho, as Daryl mentioned, um, it's difficult for an organization such as K's to become self-sustaining because we do, we don't have uh, uh, a huge number of industries, for example. Um, the community that where I spent most of my professional career had 14 universities uh, and several multi-billion dollar uh, corporations w within a single county and in a place like that it's easy to do a case like entity that becomes self-sustaining um, I think part part of the the reason the case has been successful frankly is that uh, it, it is not trying to do so. It is, what K's is all about is sustaining the partnership, to keep, keeping people uh, focused on collaborating. And uh, uh, in reality, K's uh, itself costs very little money um, compared to the return on investment, most of which is uh, most of which benefits the universities. So. Uh, can, can K's become something different? Sh sure it can as, uh, as uh, time and circumstances permit, but the focus right now is on maintaining the uh, integrity of the partnership and, and keeping focus on the priorities of the partners rather than focusing on the, in the K's as an institution itself. Anybody else? The uh, work that, that uh my colleagues at uh, ISU and U of I and myself have done over the past couple of years have, has been um, funded from private sources that, uh, that has gone through K's and, uh, you know, I think it's easier in economics than it is for, for other disciplines, but, you know, at least, it's, at least that's happening to some degree. Oh, please. Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> what would happen to the collaboration if government funding decreased? Who draws the short straw on that one? Huh? <laughs> well, I think government funding is decreasing, and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll have to change our, uh, our, our reach. But uh, on the other hand, I think that the, uh, the success of the universities, by collaborating, will uh, sustain K's in, in, uh, in essence. It's, it's too valuable to walk away from. If I may as well. Yeah. I, I think also what's been um, reiterated previously is um, through K's, you know, we're building our um, profile and to be not only I think nationally but internationally known we're bringing in uh, better faculty or more faculty um, which is going to improve um, also through the universities we are engaging in um, endeavors I guess to um, increase the technology that's being developed and deployed um, so I think that's something that could uh, help case in the future uh, and we're also looking at, at extending our collaborations. It's not just between um, the three Idaho universities and INL, but we've, you know, through this, we've been collaborating with other universities, with other, uh, you know, private partners, and, and that will only be of, of benefit, I think, in the future. Dr. Bailey, any, any follow-on? Okay, all right, thank you. Thanks, gentlemen. Um, Dr. Rudin, please. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you very much for the presentation. I appreciate that. Um, you know, I've heard, and through a number of presentations related to the case, I've heard a lot about this return on investment and bringing a lot of federal money into 
uh, Idaho in terms of research grants and, and so forth. And um, although I've heard smatterings of this in the past, today was the first time I really heard about a concerted effort to develop intellectual property. And I know that CASE does a lot of basic research, and uh, now that we're a number of years into CASE, do we expect to see more of that, more intellectual property development, and perhaps working towards commercializing and monetizing that intellectual property? Um, from, from my perspective, it's, it's going to become more and more important, at least for my department. I, I'm not going to speak for all the other universities. Um, and uh, I, I think that we need to be, um, as a whole, much more responsive to the faculty and, and, and facilitate um, patenting um, and also uh, empower faculty um, in a much different way to start businesses and to, um, to sell their IP. Um, certainly at Boise State, we've made an enormous amount of progress. I know that. Um, but as a whole, I think we lag behind other states. If you look at what Utah does, I mean, we compare ourselves to the U-Star program. Uh, we're, we're not really close to the U-Star program. It's something to aspire towards, that's for sure. Um, but um, in Utah, faculty are empowered um, to have businesses, uh, and uh, they have, well, at least at one of the universities, um, they have major resources to support um, IP development, and it's it's an important thing for us. I think um, how much you know we need to change, how much money we need to put into it. I don't know, but I think it's something that would really help us out. Admiral, yeah, I think a, a key oh. piece of the puzzle Sorry. that's missing in this regard is uh, <clears throat> so it's one thing to have an invention and get, obtain a patent, but it's another thing to turn it into a product. And, and while Boise State does have a, a modest new product development center, there is not a, a tremendous new product development capability in the state. That's, that's something definitely this commission may want to consider because you need those kinds of resources to take the invention, the patented invention, the IP, to turn that into a product that's going to wind up on the shelves and in the grocery cart or wherever it's going to wind up. There's several steps there that require uh, sustainment beyond just the research funding. So. Okay, thanks, gentlemen. Admiral, you had a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, gentlemen, t two questions. One, any recommendations or ideas in the areas of workforce development relative to what we're doing now and in, in the state and might uh, want to do in the future? And the second one is deals with. Um, strengthening the broader nuclear industry sector in Idaho. From your perspectives, any policy options, things that we sh should consider um, in developing that, that sector in, in the state? Um, I, I would point to the, uh, the STEC program at Idaho State University as an exemplar of building a nuclear energy workforce uh, starting at the technician and operator level. Um, based on other work that I've done, I, I would strongly recommend, and again, based on capabilities that are already in the state, that the state take a hard look at developing additional capabilities in terms of manufacturing for the commercial nuclear industry. You know, they've got to make pumps, valves, piping, controls, et cetera, they can be made. These are not big, heavy things that have to travel by train or ship. These are things that can be manufactured anywhere. And I've seen in, in other places people uh, stand up, for example, advanced re manufacturing research centers where they develop technologies alongside the research necessary to manufacture and qualify the parts and pieces that go into existing nuclear power plants and that will be in demand in the future. So, you know, given the success of, and you know, I'm thinking of the companies in eastern Idaho now, like Premier and uh, uh, Diversified Manufacturing and American Fabrication, et cetera, these are companies who, who are world-class competitors now, although small, but we could build on that early success and with the right kind of support, you know, develop 
uh, educational capabilities that, that produce people who can compete in advanced manufacturing and in turn attract the machine tool manufacturers and attract the, uh, the commercial buyers who would want to come here and have these products uh, developed and manufactured. Any additional questions? Please, Mayor. I don't have a question. Um, I would hope that uh, the rest of my colleagues here, we just want to say thank you um, for putting this together, for setting an example. Um, I think this is uh, one of those things that the state really uh, could really utilize and uh, we can learn much from. And uh, so we just appreciate all your hard work and efforts and if you could please pass that down to those that uh, you associate with, that'd be great. Thanks, Mayor. I actually have one other question. I want to take advantage of the fact that we have some scientists in front of us, and I just want to throw out a question, and if it's, it's out of your scope, we would understand, but you've been a part today of a lot of rhetoric. There's a lot of social and political rhetoric around the storage of, of spent fuel and nuclear waste. And yet when we as a commission toured the INL and the Navy facility and other things, what we saw is a distinct difference between the legacy waste, the barrels and, and boxes, as Governor Andrus referred to, that were dumped in the ground versus the modern storage and, and handling of the, you know, the, 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 uh, the spent fuel. Can you as technicians and scientists speak to the advancements in technology that um, have happened underneath all of the political and social rhetoric that might help us understand where the technology is and what its capabilities of when it comes to protecting the environment and improving the safety in, in that storage arena? Um, yeah, so um, first of all, I, I agreed with a lot of the things that were said by the Snake River Alliance, um, uh, but I, I, I agree strongly that we should seek to be a carbon-free um, energy uh, society um, and nuclear frankly is one of the only ways it's going to get us there that's, um, that's just a reality when you look at the math mm -hmm. it's just it's just a fact you can't get around mm -hmm. it um, also you know if you look at if you look at uh, you know the amount of waste that we generate from nuclear and compare it to the amount of waste that we generate from carbon sources uh, and you realize the hazards associated with carbon sources um, if we take the amount, if we take all the CO2 that we produce in the world annually and convert it from a gas to a liquid, it would cover the United States several inches deep. How interesting! Uh, and the way we dispose of that is by putting it into our atmosphere. Um, so that's how we dispose of that waste right now. Um, the beauty of nuclear waste is that we, when we dispose of it, we contain it right now and we contain it fairly well. Um, we we have the legacy of you know the 19. 60s and 70s, I guess, right. uh, that we have to live with, but things have changed tremendously. Um, the barriers now between the waste and us are substantial. Um, okay. And uh, so I think we can be pretty confident that you know, it's not going to be perfect. Nothing is perfect. No energy source is perfectly safe. No energy source is perfect for the environment. There's something wrong. We, we give something up with every form of energy um, That's a good point. to get something else, right? Uh, and so it's a balance between, uh, you know, our national security, our economic security, our environmental security, and you have to make choices. Uh, nuclear, you know, is pretty safe. We unfortunately have these examples um, every decade or two that mm -hmm. uh, set us back. Um, but when you look at the, the safety record of the nuclear industry uh, over the last uh, 20 years, anyway, it's, it's pretty incredible. Um, I don't want to recommend policy. I don't want to recommend policy for the state of Idaho, but uh, no, just, you know, I think uh, we can be pretty confident that, that nuclear is a fairly safe technology today. Um, and we have ideas of what to do with the waste. And we should also be trying to get as much energy back from the spent fuel that we have that we possibly can. We can't afford to leave that, that energy um, sitting in a waste container uh, if we could be using it. So That's a good point. Those are some of my opinions. Anybody else? Thank you. Please. I would just mention that uh, if you look at the advancements in robotics and electronics technology and sensor systems and uh, how computers are you know, deployed in industry, there have been tremendous advances. Uh, material science, for example. So the whole idea of 
containing and handling uh, relatively small volumes of hazardous waste as compared to CO2 or some of the other energy options. Uh, I think there's, the, the future is, is very bright in that regard. Um, you know, I, you know I've, I've only been at the lab for about six years now, but uh, there are hardly any of the, the scientists that work on waste issues. They always talk about, well, we're, we're going to get this right. We're going to understand how to contain this and, and sequester it, but someday we'll be coming back for it. So, That's helpful. Thank you. Any other thoughts? Please. Uh, just, uh, just to follow on what Dr. Bob was saying in terms of the waste that's produced, at least from, from the nuclear power industry, um, yeah, from, from carbon sources, uh, you mentioned uh, you could cover the waste um, or cover the entire United States. Well, the waste produced from nuclear energy would fill in a, a stadium, in the Boise State Stadium. That's, that's the amount of waste we're looking at if you include uh, spent fuel, um, high-level waste, and even uh, low-level waste. Uh, I think we also have to look at the accomplishments of the WIP site, the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant, which has been very successful in in um, housing, um, you know, their waste. Uh, you also have to look at the transportation issue. There's not been one fatality from a transportation event related to moving um, high level or, or uh, high level waste or spent nuclear fuel. Um, so the safety record is, is impeccable. Same thing again with the nuclear power industry. There have been some unfortunate instances with. Um, TMI, Chernobyl, and now Fukushima, but if you look at the thousands of, of years that nuclear power plants have operated in the U.S., um, you know, the, um, uh, again, the safety record uh, and operational record is, is unmatched. So, oh, That's all very helpful. Thank you, gentlemen. Please. And then just one other thing. Um, the, the economic benefits are huge, not only for uh, continued development of large nuclear plants, but as I mentioned, the development of, of small modular units as well. And if we don't do it here, it, it will be done. And if we don't do it here, it'll be, it will be done elsewhere. So it will be, it will be done. And so we might as well capture those, those benefits to our economy. That's a very good point. Thank you. Any other questions? Gentlemen, thank you for responding to our invitation and for taking the time. We appreciate these insights.